All right, chemistry, let's take a look at our video lecture for this uh, chapter 10, section 1. Uh, we will be combining sections 1 and 2 on the assessment, but we'll deal with section 1 in this video lecture. Uh, in section 1, I want you to be able to state the kinetic molecular theory of matter and describe how it explains certain properties of matter. Uh, we're going to focus mainly on gases in this chapter, so it'll be mostly uh, properties of gases. List the five assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory of gases, and then define the terms ideal gas and real gas. Describe each of the following characteristics, uh, characteristic properties of gases, expansion, density, fluidity, compressibility, diffusion, and effusion. And then describe the conditions under which a, uh, a real gas deviates from ideal behavior. So let's get started. Uh, an ideal gas is a hypothetical gas, meaning it does not exist in real life. When we add that L to the word ideal, it no longer exists in real life. Um, you young people in high school, that ideal boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, you know, that, that person that, you know, likes basketball, likes video games, likes um, art, likes the same type of music, likes to watch anime, um, likes to watch movies, likes to go for runs. All these huge, this huge list of, of things that the perfect partner is going to have uh, in your mind. However, is there a, such a person in real life? No, it's an ideal. It doesn't exist. Uh, what you're going to have to do is prioritize the things on that list and, and then you know uh, choose a partner appropriately. But that's what it means to be ideal. It does not exist in real life. The kinetic molecular theory of gases is based on uh, uh, five assumptions. Five assumptions. And an ideal gas is, again, a hypothetical gas. It doesn't exist in real life. That perfectly fits all of these five assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory. And you are going to have to know these five. And you're going to be using these five assumptions to explain why gases behave the way they do. So, number one. Gases consist of large numbers of uh, tiny particles that are far away uh, from each other relative to their size. Again, huge numbers of particles, gigantic numbers of particles here, but very, very, very tiny particles that are far apart uh, from each other. Now, they're going to be so far away from one another uh, that their actual size, the size of the actual particles, is negligible. Doesn't mean it's actually zero, okay? But compared to how far away, compared to how much of that particle is, is empty space, the volume of the actual particle is negligible. For existence, if we take uh, two basketballs and you know they're a foot apart from one another, the distance between the two is relatively small compared to the size of the actual objects, the basketballs. But if we take those basketballs and we place them a mile apart from one another, the distance between those basketballs is so significant that when you're measuring that distance, the size of the basketballs does not change. It, it, it's, it's, it's negligible. It's almost zero. Technically, it's not zero, but it, essentially for calculations, for useful uh, qualitative analysis, it's zero. And so what that means for us is that most of the volume occupied by a gas is empty space. Most of the volume occupied by a gas is empty space. Moving on to number two and three. Collisions between gas particles and between uh, particles and the container walls are elastic collisions. Now it is true uh, that even though these gas particles are so far apart from one another that sometimes they do come into contact and they collide with one another. That's not quite as common, doesn't happen quite as often as particles colliding with container walls. Uh, I'll talk about that when we get to number three. But uh, these gas particles will hit stuff. Okay, they will they will travel until they hit something, and when they do, those collisions are elastic. And elastic, an elastic collision is uh, a collision in which there is absolutely no net loss of total kinetic energy. It's kind of like when you're playing billiards, and you know you smack that cue ball as hard as you can. It goes and it hits the eight ball, and the cue ball just completely stops after contact. Well, you didn't lose the kinetic energy there. It was just transferred into the eight ball, right? So there's no net loss of kinetic energy. Now we know 
that eventually those billiard balls are going to come to a come to a stop. You know, lost through drag here and there. Uh, but in this ideal situation for an ideal gas, there's absolutely no loss of kinetic energy. Now, number three, gas particles are in continuous rapid random motion. They therefore uh, possess kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. So remember, these uh, these gas particles particles are moving around and they collide, like we said in assumption number two. They collide with each other and they collide with uh, the container walls because they're set off in motion, right? They have a lot of kinetic energy in them, and that's actually what temperature is a measure of. But they take off in a direction, and they and it. There's no purpose to that direction. It's just wherever the force of their acceleration brings them. And unless they are forced to change uh, direction by a collision with another gas particle or collision with the container, they will continue on that same path until they are forced to change direction. Right? Continuous motion. And even after they collide with something, they will continue in motion because there's no net loss of kinetic energy. If they, they collide with a container wall or another gas particle, they're going to continue to move. They'll just change direction. Uh, again, they possess, they possess kinetic energy, which is the energy of movement. Okay, All things in existence contain kinetic energy. It might be a very, very small amount of kinetic energy, but there is kinetic energy there. Right? Even something that's solid, that doesn't seem to be moving, actually has this teeny tiny little bit of vibrational movement. So there is kinetic energy there. Uh, moving on to uh, numbers four and five. Uh, there are no forces of attraction between gas particles. Okay? So as these uh, gas particles are moving throughout a container, you can just picture a bottle if you want, if that helps you uh, picture what's going on here. There are no forces of attraction whatsoever between gas particles. Ga two gas particles can pass very, very closely cl uh, to one another, but they will not influence each other's paths. They will continue on that straight line that they were already on. Okay, it does not matter if they come they come close to one another. There's there's no uh, you know polarity there. There's no uh, uh, attractive force. There's no repulsive force. They just keep going. Number five, the temperature of a gas depends on the average kinetic energy of the particles of that gas. Uh, and we now know that that actually is what we're measuring when we measure temperature. When you take a, a old school mercury thermometer. Uh, that you know the r little red line extends up as it gets warmer and goes down as it gets colder what you're actually seeing is expansion and contraction of mercury why is there expansion and contraction of that mercury with a temperature change because if you're increasing temperature you're adding vibrational energy to that mercury and it causes an expansion it causes a drop in density uh, it's just like, you know, if you have a group of students that are that are very, very still, you can pack them close to one another. But once they start moving around, getting rowdy, they, you know, by nature, they have to uh, uh, occupy more space because of the collisions and the movements uh, that they are going to have. Now, the kinetic energy of any moving object, and yes, all objects um, are moving to some extent, right? It might be, you know, extremely negligible, but they are moving is given by the following equation. And this is going to be an equation that we can use uh, to calculate uh, the mass of a particle, the velocity of the particle, or the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy um, of a particular uh, set of particles. Kinetic energy is equal to half the mass of that particle multiplied by the velocity of that particle squared. And this is also going to be an equation that you use next year in physics. So it would it behoove you to get used to uh, this equation. The kinetic molecular theory describes the behavior of gas molecules and the physical properties of gases. The kinetic molecular theory views gases as being made up of large fast-moving particles that are far apart from each other. Most of the volume occupied by a gas is empty space. Gas particles are in continuous rapid random motion, and the forces of attraction or repulsion between them are essentially non-existent. Kinetic molecular theory relates the kinetic energy of gas particles to the temperature of the gas. Thank you, robot lady. 
So again, the kinetic molecular theory is connecting the movement of particles to the temperature of those particles. It's making the connection there. All gases at the same temperature have the same average kinetic energy. Now at the same temperature, having the same average kinetic energy, lighter particles, uh, remember we're talking about gases here, lighter gas particles have a higher average speed than do heavier gas particles, i.e. hydrogen molecules will have a higher speed than oxygen molecules. Because the oxygen molecules have more mass and you're having to move more stuff with that same amount of kinetic energy. And you have that experience in regular life. You know, if, if a teeny tiny dog like a chihuahua is just running at you super fast, you know, and, and jumps, uh, jumps at you, that it's not going to knock you back. Not because it's not going fast, but because it has no mass, or, you know, essentially no mass. But if a big German shepherd just kind of like saunters up to you and just kind of jumps up on you, it's probably not going to knock you back either. The mass is much greater, but now the velocity is lower. So they, they both have the same amount of impact, the same kinetic energy, the same energy of movement. And so that's its effect on you are going to be the same, even though mass is different, velocity is different, kinetic energy is the same. Uh, let's see. So now we're going to get into uh, some properties of gases. But the last thing I want to say about the kinetic molecular theory um, is that the kinetic molecular theory applies only to ideal gases. Real gases don't act like this perfectly. Some of them get close. Some of them get close. In fact, many gases will behave nearly ideally if pressure is not very high and temperature is not very low. So if we have low pressure and high temperature, we can get gases to behave close to ideally. It won't be perfect, but it'll be close. Right? So if we want to get a gas to behave ideally, we want, um, sorry, we want low pressure and high temperature. Now let's get into those uh, characteristic properties of gases that we want to be able to explain. First off, expansion. Now, you may have already known that gases do not have a definite shape or a definite um, volume uh, because you, you've thought about this in terms of uh, the fact that gases will completely fill any container in which they're enclosed. We can explain this with the kinetic molecular theory. Gas particles, remember, they move rapidly in all directions, right? That was assumption number three. Uh, and they don't have any significant attraction uh, between them. And so that means that as those gas particles move out, move in their random directions, they will continue to do so until they collide with something, i.e. the container wall. And so they will fill that container, especially once they've hit the container wall. Moving on to fluidity. Because the attractive forces of, uh, between gas particles are insignificant, there's no attraction. Remember that was assumption four? Gas particles will glide easily past one another. They won't stick together. They won't change uh, their course based on interactions between one another. That is actually what we call flowing, gliding past one another. You can flow. A river will flow down a, um, a riverbed because it's easily moving over those rocks. Right? So that ability to gl uh, glide easily past something is considered flowing. And it, because you, know, you already know that liquids flow, but because gases flow as well, we have this term to refer to both of them, fluids. Both gases and liquids are fluids because they flow. Moving on to uh, density and compressibility. The density of, the, uh, of a gaseous substance at atmospheric pressure, right? that's just normal sea level pressure, is about one one thousandth the density of that same substance in the liquid or solid state. So that means when something, for example, water transitions from the liquid state to the gaseous state, right, from liquid water to steam, there's going to be a, an expansion okay, on, on the order of about a thousand times, a thousand times. Now you have the exact same amount of water that you did, so you have the same mass, but the volume has increased a thousand fold that is going to result in incredibly low density of the gas compared to its liquid form. Now, the reason that these particles are so much further apart uh, in the gaseous statement, we can explain um, because of assumption number one. Gases are made of very tiny particles, a large number of tiny particles that are so far away from one another 
uh, that their, uh, their actual particle size is negligible. Uh, compressibility. So during compression, okay, it's trying to squeeze things together, the gas particles, which are initially very far apart, remember according to assumption one, have the ability to be crowded closer together. Remember, the reason they expand is because of their random movement. But if we become purposeful and we try to squish them back together, we can because there's so much empty space between them. All right, so we can actually compress them quite a bit. Uh, let's see, I believe we're finishing up uh, with diffusion and effusion. Now, you may have heard of one of these in biology class. Uh, gases will spread out and mix with one another even without being stirred. That's because the random and continuous motion of the gas molecules, remember assumption three, constant, rapid, random motion, carries them throughout any available space. Remember, picture the bottle. Okay, all those particles are just moving around randomly. And so they will mix together without being stirred, quote unquote. Uh, the spontaneous mixing, right, because we're not actually stirring it, of the two types of particles of two different substances caused by their random, rapid, constant motion is called diffusion. Effusion is very closely related to diffusion, but effusion is the process by which gas particles pass through a tiny opening, okay, so a, a tiny opening in that bottle. The rates of effusion, right, moving through that tiny opening, of different gases are directly proportional to the velocities of their particles. So molecules of low mass, meaning high speed, remember that um, kinetic energy is equal to one-half mv squared? So if a molecule has low mass, it's got high velocity. And if it's got high velocity, uh, the molecule will diffuse faster. If the molecule's got high mass, it's going to have low velocity, and therefore it's going to effuse more slowly. And so here we have just have some GIF animations. We have diffusion over here on the left. You can see that it, everything starts bunched up, but once the, uh, these little red particles are allowed to move how they want, they randomly spread out, and you can see at the end of the animation, they actually end up being uniformly distributed throughout the container. Over here on the right, looking at effusion, we have everything start in our little bottle, but then we open a hole, and we see that randomly, through just the random bouncing around of the gas particles, gases will make it out of the container. One thing we do want to take away, however, we have the green spheres here with a smaller mass, therefore a uh, larger velocity, and the blue spheres here with a larger mass, therefore uh, a smaller velocity, uh, are going to have different rates of effusion. So you guessed it, the smaller, faster green spheres are going to make it out of the container more quickly than the larger, slower blue spheres. Gases differ from solids and liquids in that they expand to fill the shape of their container. Because there are large distances between gas molecules, gases have extremely low densities. Carbon dioxide, for example, is less dense than water, so bubbles of carbon dioxide rise to the surface. Gases are compressible to small fractions of their initial volumes. Because of this, large amounts of oxygen can be stored in tanks for scuba diving. Gases mix readily by diffusion. We don't have to stir or shake them to make them mix. Gases can escape containers through tiny holes in a process called effusion. This occurs when a bicycle tire is punctured. All right, and our last slide for this lecture, deviations of real gases from ideal behavior. Remember that gases are not going to behave, real gases that you will encounter as a real person will not behave like this. They will not perfectly follow all of those five assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory perfectly. They will get kind of close at times, not so close at other times, but they're going to fall short at, at some point. So because, and we can go back uh, through those assumptions and see at what point they aren't truly, strictly correct, uh, we can go back and say, well, because the particles of gases, they actually do occupy space, even though they're incredibly small uh, relative to the distances between particles, they really do occupy some space. And so even though th they're almost negligible, they actually do inhabit space. 
Um, a real gas, therefore, is a gas that does not behave completely. It can be close. It could be close. But it doesn't behave completely according to the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory. At very high pressures and low temperatures, a gas is more likely to behave in a non-ideal way. Remember earlier in the, in the lecture, we talked about what it takes for a gas to um, approach ideal behavior. It's the opposite of what we just read on this third bullet here. Right? We said for ideal behavior, we want low pressures and high temperatures. But for real behavior, right? if we want to deviate from uh, ideal behavior, we want high pressures and low temperatures. And then lastly, the more polar the molecules of gas are, the more the gas will deviate from ideal gas behavior, more polar. Because when you're polar, right, you have a negative side and you have a positive side, or at least partially, that is going to be the basis for attractive and repulsive forces between gas particles. And that was one of the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory of gases, that there is no attractive or repulsive forces. And so when you have polarity involved, you have attraction and repulsion, and you're going to behave less ideally. All right, chemistry, that's going to do it for this video lecture. I will see you next period.